Welcome to another segment of the BYU Management Society's Learn From Professionals initiative. Our goal is to provide guidance to young adults that are either exploring various careers or are ready to jumpstart a career. Today, we have an opportunity to learn from a seasoned professional in the dentistry industry, Dr. Stephen Chrysler. Welcome, Dr. Chrysler. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We want to thank you for your willingness to share your expert advice uh, with our viewers. So Dr. Chrysler is originally from Elko, Nevada. He graduated from high school in 1991 and attended Utah Valley Community College the following year. After Steve's first year in college, he served a two-year mission for his church in Micronesia, where he spent the majority of his time in the Chuk Lagoon. Upon returning in 2004, Steve continued his studies at Brigham Young University for two more years before attending dental school at the University of Louisville. Upon graduating from dental school in May of 2000, he entered the United States Dental Corps where he served five years at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii and Fort Carson, Colorado. Dr. Chrysler transitioned to private practice at Powers Dental Group in 2005, becoming a partner in 2006, and has been there ever since. At Powers Dental, he and his uh, partners have opened several other dental, general, and specialty offices to serve the Colorado Springs area. Steve is married with five children. He loves the, the great outdoors, uh, playing and watching sports, and uh, hanging out with his family. So Steve, can you tell us a little bit about what made you decide to pursue a career as a dentist? Well, that's kind of interesting. I originally wanted to be a baseball player, but that doesn't pan out for a lot of people. So my brother wanted to be a dentist and my good friend growing up wanted to be a dentist. So I thought in the back of my mind, well, if I'm not going to play baseball, then then maybe I'll be a dentist. And then uh, interestingly enough, when I went to college, uh, um, a girl that I dated, you know, encouraged me to apply to, to dental school when I got back from my mission. And uh, her role in my life was to get me to apply to dental school and I got in and we broke up and that was the, the role of, of her. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, my, my path was kind of a unique one and I'm sure we'll get into that. Well, tell us about your career path and, and what do you think has helped you to become so successful in your career? Well, um, so the career path, uh, was a little bit interesting. So I only went to three years of undergrad. Most people that go to dental school, they get a bachelor's degree and and they apply and they get in. Well, I got in only doing three years of undergrad. And uh, it's, a, it's a little secret um, that not, not many people know about, but not a lot of schools, uh, a few schools, I should say, allow you to enter into dental school without having an undergrad degree. And I was just lucky enough to apply to University of Louisville uh, to where they they accepted me without having an undergrad degree. Um, so um, a, there are certain requirements that you have to have in in undergraduate and uh, you take a lot of chemistry classes, uh, a lot of uh, biology classes, a lot of sciences. Uh, you can have any major you want. You can be an English major if you wanted to or as I was, I was a psychology major. And uh, but I had taken, you know, uh, some of the courses that, that was needed for dental school. Um, some schools are really, really rigid in the classes that they that they require. Other schools are a little more lax on on some of the classes that they that they accept. I know that there's, you know, like 55 dental schools throughout the United States and uh, um and they all require a little bit of, you know, different things. So where I went to school, they um, went a lot off of your interview. They wanted good GPA. They weren't as rigid about the classes that that I had to take. Um, they wanted some science background. And uh, anyway, a lot of people that are going into medicine and dentistry, they tend to 
um, be science majors. They tend to be biology majors or biochemistry majors, or and they're gung ho with with the sciences. Um, where I went to school at Louisville, um, they wanted they went a lot off of, off of the interview and went uh, a lot off of GPA and everything else kind of uh, fell into place. So anyway, that was kind of my career path. Um, I'm sorry, what was your other question? Well, just what's helped you to become so successful? Okay. Well, success is that that's a loaded question. I, I try to compartmentalize things. Um, it, success um, really is just treating patients right and treating your team right. And uh, if you treat others, everything else really will fall into place. So it's it's really quite simple. Uh, to be successful, just do the right thing and treat people well. Uh, both patients and staff, and and everything will 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 take care of itself. Uh huh. Steve, can you tell us what's what's the best career advice that someone's given you? So that that very thing is to just treat people right, uh -huh. um, and that has gone a long way. If you if you do the right thing, um, and not everything goes goes as planned. Um, really what patients know is if it hurts and if you're nice. And so if you, you know, um, kind of pave your way with words ahead of time and, and it's not a comfortable thing to go to the dentist and, uh, it's, it's something a lot of people dread. And so you tread lightly and you, you be friendly. And, uh, you know, if somebody communicates something to you, then listen to them. Um, so, um, so that is another thing is, is listen to the patients and communication is key. Um, if you have an agenda and you don't listen to uh, your patients or even your staff, and uh, just because you've got the doctorate degree, um, things don't bode well with that. But if you're humble and you, you um, just listen to people and you communicate, a lot of things will, will go your way, so. Sure. Can you tell us how you got associated with uh, with Powers Dental Group? So uh, that that brings up another thing. Um, networking is a huge thing. It, it's life is about who you know, and who you know brings opportunities that come your way. So when I was in the Army Dental Corps uh, back in two thousand four, um, uh, there was a particular dentist that got out, and he joined Powers Dental. Uh, right before me, and uh, they were growing, and uh, they needed another doc, and he came to me, and he said, hey, Steve, we need another guy, and really, I just went down there, I I, I met with all the guys, I, I saw how they did things, so I was there, down there a day, and they're like, okay, you want to start coming in, and near the end of, of my Army tenure, I had a lot of leave built up, and so a couple days a week, I'd come in, and uh, joined them full time in in the summer of 2005 when I when I got out. But uh, so it, it was networking that actually got me uh, the job at, mm -hmm. at Powers Dental. Okay, so you mentioned uh, you mentioned the Army. So when you graduated from dental school, you entered the the United States Army Dental Corps. So what motivated you to join the Army? Well, when I think back, uh, this was back in in 96. So I'd gone through the first semester of dental school and I borrowed a whopping like twenty five thousand dollars. And I thought, how in the world am I going to repay this student loan? And uh, so during my second semester of dental school, I applied for an army scholarship and uh, they have general dentists just like they do uh, anywhere else on the outside in in the civilian world and uh, so they needed dentists and they were going to pay for the the next three years of dental school pay all tuition books and fees and back then they gave me a stipend to live on it was about a thousand dollars a month so i was actually making money going to dental school once i got that scholarship so i applied and uh, uh, all said and done i was about Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars in debt, um, and by the end of the first year. But I realized after that first semester that holy cow, uh, that debt was racking up. And uh, anyway, so the the army was a blessing in in a lot of ways. You don't make as much money 
in in active duty service, but you gain a lot of valuable experience. Um, I was able to do a one year uh, advanced education in general dentistry. It's a one year residency uh, mm. for general dentists, and we we spent about two months in each specialty. Uh, two months doing root canals, two months doing oral surgery, two months doing gum surgery with with periodontist um, and uh, did a lot of pediatric stuff. Um, anyway, so it gave us a lot of experience doing some advanced things. When you come out of dental school, it's really interesting. You're able, you're licensed to do whatever you want. Um, if you want to go do oral surgery, if you want to do gum grafts, if you want to do root canals, you're licensed to do that, but you're held to the standard of a specialist. And so a lot of dentists, um, they don't choose to do some of these more advanced procedures, but getting this advanced education in, in general dentistry was, was a blessing because it exposed me to a lot of different things that I still use today. Um, so, um, so even though, uh, Yes, you don't make as much uh, when you're active duty. Yes, they paid for all tuition, books, and fees. So I came out of dental school without any more debt than I had racked up my first year, and it gave me more valuable experience. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, so you've mentioned uh, advanced learning, and uh, is there... Um... Are there any additional certifications or advanced learning that, that dentists typically go through possibly to, to get that specialty training? So the answer is yes. There, there's a lot of additional training you can get in the it and some of it is state dependent. We're required every every uh, two years to get 30 hours of continuing education. And you can get that in practice management, um, you can get that in 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 different areas of dentistry like oral surgery or 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 just regular doing implants and crowns and stuff like that um, um or you can go on and get more advanced education there are specialists in dentistry and a lot of specialty programs are between they're, they're between two and six years depending on what you do hmm. um to be an oral surgeon it's between four and six years depending on the program some of those degrees uh require an md some of them don't um, so some of them are DMD, MD. Um, anyway, an, an orthodontist, for instance, they'll go to an extra two years uh, to three years. Uh, a root canal specialist, same thing. Um, so, yes, you can become a specialist if you go to additional residency training and then you're considered a specialist in that field. Uh, as a general dentist, which is interesting, again, um, you can do any of those specialty things but you're held to the standard of a specialist. So anyway, getting additional training um, uh, really helps to expand what, number one, you, you get to see what you like to do, and number two, what you're good at. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are certain procedures uh, that I learned really quickly that, yes, I love to do these things, and, and no, I don't like to do other things. And uh, anyway, and so that translates into something else being in a big group practice where I'm at, and we can get into this in a few minutes, but uh, every, I'm in a large group practice where there's like eight or nine general dentists and we rotate through and there are things that I don't like to do that other partners love to do. And so what we do is we keep them, the patients in the practice and they'll do some of the procedures I don't like to do. And I'll do a lot of the procedures that they don't like to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the additional training gives you exposure to things that you, you really like, you really enjoy and other things that you're like, you know what, let's let somebody else do that. Sure. Well, that makes sense. And I know in my profession, it seems like I'm always doing continued education. So, um, so Steve, what, what do you, uh, You've been a dentist for, for quite some time. What do you consider to be the most important rewards and also the the challenges of being a dentist? So I would say the rewards. Um, uh, number one is it allows you uh, time and money to do other things, to live life. I've mm -hmm. always thought of dentistry and my job as a support for my family and and my lifestyle, what I like to do. Um, it, it allows you enough freedom to make other investments, to make enough money to make other investments, to do other things um, 
it also allows you to go on vacations and and uh you know have some of the nicer things in life that that allow you to um spend time with your family and and make it a better life for them um so those are some of the um the rewards um if you like people then dentistry is for you if you're not a people person then you may not want to to go into this field because a lot of it is talking with patients and and basically loving patients um and loving their story and listening to what they want and and what they need ultimately th their wants are their needs and uh um anyway what was the second part of the question what are some challenges. of the challenges the challenges so some of the challenges um if you're a perfectionist a dentistry is really really hard because the body doesn't respond the same for everybody a filling on one person uh will hurt like crazy and uh, filling on another person the same thing it, it, they'd have no problems at all and you have to be able to be patient and and uh work through through some things and just know that not everything you do goes right and i'll tell you if 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 patients have a problem and you you welcome them back and you don't charge them extra money and you're like okay let's figure this out um then then uh you're gonna go you know things will go a long way mm -hmm. um that's kind of hard to learn though with somebody fresh out of school um they don't teach you a lot of psychology stuff with dealing with patients and with um with problem solving uh both you know with patients and with with practice things um but if again we go back to to being being patient and listening and and just doing the right thing um when something doesn't go right um which things happen you know uh, on occasion you'll do a crown and it ends up needing a root canal and it's one of those things to where if you pave your way with words ahead of time and just make patients aware um so that that some of the challenges is is early on is figuring that out um and uh if you're not able to figure that out and you are not humble about it um then a lot of times uh things won't go go right so mm -hmm. that's that's really interesting so um steve you have a lot of outside outside into interests you you love the great outdoors um, you love playing sports and watching sports and, and you also volunteer in the temple. So how long did it take in your career before you had enough free time to pursue those other interests? So early on in the, in the, in, as in most careers, um, you spend a lot of time, um, in dentistry, uh, when, while I was in the army, we, uh, um, we, we worked five days a week about a 40 hour work week. And uh, anyway, when I came into private practice, the model of my private practice was to work uh, 24 hours a week. And uh, we were in shifts and then four, six hour shifts is what they wanted us to do. But there were a couple of us that were really young and hungry and wanted actually to make more money and to get ahead, to pay bills off and stuff like that. And, and so we, um, we talked our partners into letting us do 36 hours a week, which was six, um, six hour shifts. And, uh, and a lot of times we would, you know, we're open, you know, 12 hours a day, Monday through Thursday and a 10 hour day on Friday. And, uh, so a lot of times we would pull a double shift from 7am to 7pm and to get more hours. Mm -hmm. Um, so for about, I would say 10, 12 years, um, it, I worked a full from 36 to 40 hours a week. And then from then, um, at about 12 years, I, I tapered down to about 30 hours a week, which was about five shifts. And over the last couple of years, I've gone down to, uh, 24 hours a week, which is two long days. I work Mondays and Tuesdays. And again, they're long shifts. They're, uh, they're from seven to seven. And, uh, anyway, um, and that allows me more free time. So I take Wednesday uh, through the next Sunday off. Um, so it, it took a few years to be able to get there, um, but it's allowed me to, again, to make enough to be able to make other investments and do other interests. And to. Um, so I still enjoy dentistry. Um, 
but there are just other things, other interests that I have, like coaching sports, you know, with the kids and taking family vacations and uh, um, just having a collegiate athlete in our family, you know, taking time off on a whim just to to fly to, you know, the East Coast to, to watch her play. Um, so anyway. Interesting. Wow. Well, what do you consider, and you, you mentioned being empathetic to to the your your patients' concerns, their fears. I know when I get into the dental chair, if they come at me with a with a needle, I'm just about ready to bolt for the door. So I get real concerned about that. But what what do you consider to be the characteristics of the most successful dental practices? So the most successful dental practices is um they 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 the the doctor or the dentist the person in charge actually listens to his staff members and listens to the patients Commu again communication and learning the nonverbal cues and stuff as as people come in doing the right thing again you know by by the patients uh um, i'm going to go back to if you know something doesn't go right then welcome the patients back and uh, that goes a lot further than any advertising or anything else. So as a practice, we hardly do any advertising outside. Uh, when I first got there back in 05, 06, we had, you know, I don't know, it was like a $130,000 budget for advertising from the yellow pages to everything out, er everything else. And by the time, you know, 2012, 2013 hit, we, we decided to mix the yellow pages all together and we didn't miss a beat. We don't do any advertising. Um, like in newspapers and, and stuff like that or on TV, it's all word of mouth, which is interesting. And it's Google reviews. And, uh, you know, are our reviews perfect? The answer is no, you know, but th there's, there's I, I think it's like 4.8 or 4.9. So it's really high. Um, and a lot of that is because we put the patients uh, first. Uh, a lot of that comes from, you um, you know, our office manager and the people that we have in place, a lot of it comes from, um, you know, a mission statement that we have that that puts our staff, our God and our patients first. And uh, we just try to do the right thing. Um, so the most successful dental practices um, will will um, just cater to uh, those around them. Um, one of the biggest things in dentistry right now is a labor shortage. And um, with an office like ours that has like over 50 employees, and we have several other offices with a bunch more employees, um, it, we, we try to keep um, our people happy. And part of that is, is it, it's only part of that is only pay. Uh, a bigger part of that is um, just giving them vac vacation when they want vacation um, and treating them right. Um, anyway. So. so Steve, you, you mentioned a labor shortage. Are there any other trends that are impacting dentistry now? So, so labor shortage is, is probably the biggest thing and, uh, and keeping the people and the employees that, that you have. Um, the, the biggest expense that we have, um, is turnover. And I'll tell you if, if, uh, let me digress a little bit. The, the uh, the assistant or the team around the doctor are the people that make you or break you, mm -hmm. quite frankly, it's not the doctor himself. It's the, it's the supporting staff. And we are only, and I've told my team this numerous times that we're only as good as you guys. And anyway, so the, they're an intricate part of, of what happens. Um, so it, some of the challenges, so labor is one of the challenges. Another challenge that's hitting dentistry is corporate dentistry is coming in and, and scooping up dental practices. Um, there will be a day when the solo practitioner um, is no longer going to be, be out there. It's kind of like in medicine. You rarely see a doc. Um, not associated with UC Health or another big conglomerate that's come in and eaten them up. Um, so if you're a solo practitioner um, all on your own, um, it, it's very, very difficult. And part of that is that um, if you're associated with a bigger group, 
Um, it brings down supply overhead. Um, it's kind of like the Walmart model. Uh, Walmart can offer things at a lower price because they go to their suppliers and say, hey, look, you need to give us a discount because we're buying things in bulk in Walmarts all over the United States. The same thing is happening in medicine. The little mom and pop grocery store is no longer there. Why? Because they have to charge a premium for every product that they put on their shelves. Well, dentistry is kind of the same way. You're going to have a lot of uh, dental offices that are um, affiliated with with uh, with bigger groups. Uh, so, and that's something that that happened to us back in uh, 2020. Is another group came along, and it seemed like a good fit. Um, so, and their name is is MB2 Dental, and they've been great. Um, People have asked me, would you do it again? Join this other big group um, in MB2 Dental. They're associated with um, like 750 offices. And uh, we were office number 199, like when we joined back in 2020. And they've just taken off like crazy and, and with a lot of other offices. And it's more of wow. a partnership. Their model um, has been really, really good for us. Now, I've known other dental offices that have been gobbled up with sure. with other they're called dental service organizations dso's and it has not been a good fit um a lot of other dso's will come in and they'll they'll dictate kind of how to do how to do dentistry um with mb2 it's been totally different uh, we've we've um uh, kept the autonomy in other words we we can do things the way that we want to um in Part of it is that we've remained profitable. I suppose that if the profitability had gone down and um, their goal is to have 5% growth year over year, a uh, little bit difficult to do, but you know we've come close. Uh, I suppose they don't really touch you. I've heard that you know if you're negative, you know, 10%, 15% is when they really step in and say, hey, look, guys, this right. is what you need to do. Um, so that's it. Anyway, for us, we've been able to join MB2, which is in turn has, um, we've been able to implement some some systems and stuff, but we've remained autonomous. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do what we want when we want to do it and work as many hours as we want and and run the ship like we want to I run like it. That. Steve, so. can, you, can you tell me, uh, I'm sure you've had people come up to you. I know you've worked with the Young Men's Program, but... Um, if you have someone that comes up to you and says, I might be interested in uh, becoming a dentist, how, what advice would you give them for exploring a career in dentistry? Yeah, okay. First of all, just be exposed a little bit to it. Just go to dental office, ask, um, ask your dentist or, or whoever just to just shadow them for a couple of days or a day or two or a few hours and just see what they do. Um, if you think you want to be in the healthcare field, um, one of the cool things about dentistry is that a lot of dentists will work 30 um, hours, give or take. Uh, a lot of people in medicine, so if you want to be a physician, they actually, um, they're working 60 you know, plus hours in a given week. So I like the lifestyle of it. So if you're interested, you think you want to be in the healthcare field, just go and observe. Is, mm. is the first thing. If you decide you're going to go for it, um, when you attend college, the biggest thing is keep your grades high. If you have high grades, it's really competitive to get into dental school, but every A will keep you in and every B will keep you out. So yes, I got a, a few Bs. I even got a couple of Cs in undergrad and uh, it didn't keep, keep me out of dental school. But just know that the higher your GPA is, uh, the better. Um, a lot of schools like extracurricular activities, different things. They don't, some schools don't want you just to be dental, dental, dental focused and be biology, biology, biology. Go and do some extracurricular things. Volunteer um, in your community. Uh, when I was in in undergrad, I did something called the Big Brother, Big Sister program. And it's where we took in you know, a, a kid that uh, needed somebody like a big brother, big sister. And we, you know, once a week, we would go do things with them. Yeah. Um, so and I was able to serve a two, two year mission. So doing some extracurricular activities outside of, of just being dental 
uh, is good. Uh, so, so now, so now you're, you've explored your career. Uh, you've decided to become a dentist. You've gone through dentistry school, and now you want to enter the field. What advice would you give somebody that's interested in jumpstarting that career and, and really hitting the ground running? Okay, so you mean getting into dental school? No, once they've, once they've completed their academic work, now they're ready to get started. Okay, so once you're, you're into dental school and you've graduated, um, I would suggest, I, I think it's a great thing if you don't know or if you're not sure you want to do a specialty coming right out of dental school, um, then I would suggest doing a one-year just like an AEGD or another one's called a GPR, general practice residency or an advanced education general dentistry. They're, they have both one year and two year programs. Just getting your feet wet uh, just and it exposes, exposes you to, to all the different things. So um, in those residencies, it's, it's like a, you learn, I would say, 10 times as much as you do in dental school because you're actually seeing a lot of patients and you're doing a lot of things. In dental school, you do the bare minimum. You only see like one patient in the afternoon and maybe one patient in the morning. Um, but if you're in a GPR or, or an AEGD, you're going to see you know, 10, 12 patients a day. And so the experience that you gain is invaluable. Um, once you do that, I'm going to tell you not to be afraid to open up your own practice. Um, you can associate with somebody else for a while if you want to, just to just learn how private practice is. Um, I will tell you, you'll be successful though, um, no matter what you do, if you jump right into your own thing or if you're an associate with somebody else, you're gonna be immensely successful. Again, we'll go back to just listening to the patients and listening to your staff and just doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so jump starting your career and getting things going. I know it's a little scary to, to borrow, you know, a million dollars to open up your own practice. Um, ultimately, the most gratifying thing is, is owning your own thing. Some people will be an associate and some people are just wired like that to, to be an associate and to, to work for somebody else. I will tell you though, it's better to own your own gig at some mm -hmm. point, be your own boss, hire um, your own people. Um, and then when you bring your own associates on or other partners on um, it's more, it's, it's more financially rewarding. It frees you up to do, um, you know, to take vacations and, and other things to, to live life. Sure. So Steve, you, um, you talked about uh, how you first got interested in, in dentistry and, and how important networking was to you. Um, and it sounds like now you're, your business is more word of mouth. So are you still, do you still do networking to, to bring in a, a new business? So uh, the answer, the answer is yes. We're always talking with other people in the profession. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, like we have a motto, if you're not growing, you're dying. So we try to increase um, doctors and in places, and we've got two specialty clinics, we've got two general general dentistry offices. And uh, as we fill those up, uh, so it really it's 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 making the connections with the with the dental community um, because there's always people looking uh, for other opportunities uh, to work. Um, our mod or our uh, our model is to bring other providers in that are partners with us. Um, they they will associate just for a little while, but if they want to be a partner, we want to make them a partner. And it's you make it a win win for both parties, and everybody's happy. Um, okay. If if somebody feels like that they're they're taken advantage of, that's when they're going to leave and things kind of fall apart and 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 stuff like that. So yeah, so so it sounds like for you, your networking is primarily within the industry. It is. Yeah. yeah. So to uh, to wrap up this interview, uh, Steve, I just wanted to ask is, is there any other career advice that that you'd like to offer the young adults that are watching this this video or or even life advice? So career and life advice there. I think that they're, they're one and the same. Number one, just work hard and stay focused. 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you, if you, uh, if, if you're not sure what you want to do, that's okay for a little bit, but you, you gotta just pick a career path and, and just go for it and just treat people right and, and, and work hard and, and things will fall into place. If something doesn't go right, then own up to it and it's okay. And not everything will. Um, and just just be humble and be teachable and and no matter where you're at in your career if if you live by those standards just working hard and being humble and uh, uh you're going to go far no matter what your career choice i like that well steve thank you very much um to wrap up this video we'd like to remind our viewers that they can either reach out on their own to seasoned professionals like like dr chrysler to schedule an informational interview or to ask for an introduction to other professionals that they may know. Uh, to prepare for informational interviews, we recommend that you watch the video on this website titled Conducting Informational Interviews. So Dr. Chrysler, we wanna thank you again for your time and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. Okay, have a good day. Okay, thanks.